the Northrop Grumman E-2 Hawkeye has been the backbone of the tactical airborne early warning aircraft of the U.S. Armed Forces since the mid-1960s. Developed as a replacement for outdated aircraft in the aftermath of the Korean War, the Hawkeye went through a bad streak before becoming a worthy electronic warfare vehicle. The E-2 then went through several modifications after the Vietnam War to revamp its state-of-the-art avionics and electronics, and continues to serve the U.S. Air Force and Navy as an all-weather airborne command and control battle space management system with much more powerful equipment than it is commonly believed. Airborne Early Warning Aircraft H-2S was the first airborne ground scanning radar system ever produced. It was developed for the Royal Air Force Bomber Command during World War II. The radar's objective was to identify ground targets for night bombing raids on top of German cities as part of the mass bombardment strategy of Third Reich territories. It also allowed the Royal Air Force to conduct air attacks beyond the range of radar navigation assets such as Oboe and G, which were more rudimentary blind bombing systems. As the war progressed, the H-2S radar was improved to detect more targets and increase its range. Still, it quickly became obsolete as technology caught up with more powerful radar equipment. Efforts to increase the range of surface-based radars were challenging, but not impossible, with one of the main obstacles being detecting low-flying aircraft that could avoid detection by blending with the horizon. One of the many suggestions from the top brass of different militaries was to increase the size of radar antennas to bolster range. Still, it was not a compelling idea, at least not energy-wise. An enormous quantity of power supplies was required to transmit low-frequency radar pings. Moreover, an additional problem was the atmospheric trapping of radar energy related to temperature inversion. Another solution to bolster the range of radars was to use radar outposts or pickets in a specific area. With the addition of aircraft as the radar platform for these outposts, atmospheric trapping could be reduced and radar signals bolstered due to the increase in height. This led to the creation of the Airborne Early Warning Aircraft Concept, or AEW. These aircraft were equipped with antenna rays that required wideband operation, high gain, and low aerodynamic capabilities, paired with a 360-degree scanning function. The development of Airborne Early Warning Aircraft began in the 1950s. Still, success wasn't immediately achieved because of all the requirements the aircraft needed to fulfill for the antenna rays to operate correctly. For AEW-type antennas to succeed, they had to simultaneously achieve optimum gain, aerodynamics, and electronic scanning. The problem was that sometimes they opposed each other according to their location on an aircraft. Subsequently, the U.S. Air Force and Navy began to study the implementation of basic AEW designs for surveillance purposes with naval carriers. The Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation would then create the most promising design among all the aircraft manufacturers invited to cooperate with the armed forces to develop an experimental AEW aircraft. The Grumman E-1 Tracer Besides its increased radar range and capabilities, the U.S. Navy was interested in developing an AEW system with enhanced command and control sea and air surveillance functions. In the aftermath of World War II, the Douglas AD Sky Raider performed these surveillance missions for Navy carriers. The single-seat piston-engine attack aircraft entered service in 1946 and fulfilled several different roles, including as torpedo bomber, night attack, photo reconnaissance, electronic countermeasures, and AEW prototype. Although the aircraft was reliable, it began to show its age during the Korean War and was slowly replaced in the late 1950s by the Grumman E-1 Tracer, the company's first purpose-built airborne early warning aircraft. This first iteration of AEW aircraft was based on the company's successful Grumman S-2 Tracker anti-submarine warfare warplane. After its WF Navy designation, the Grumman E-1 Tracer received the nickname Willy Fudd. However, it was also called the Stoof with a Roof for its unique look that featured a strange-looking platform aboard the fuselage that contained its radar system. The E-1 Tracer had folding wings for use aboard carriers that employed Grumman's patented stow wing design. It also included a Hazeltine AN-APS-82 radar system that featured an airborne moving target indicator 
that distinguished a flying aircraft from the clutter produced by wave action at the ocean's surface, and its hardware allowed for distinguishing moving objects from stationary backgrounds. The Tracer was considered an interim-type AEW aircraft. It entered service in 1958, while the Navy and Grumman kept working on a more powerful version. Meanwhile, the Willy Fudd would see action during the early stages of the Vietnam War, before American presence in the region escalated. During its combat service, the Tracers provided combat air patrol fighters with target vectors, which quickly detected Soviet MiG aircraft activity over specific areas. Tracers also provided information for valuable Alpha strikes over North Vietnam, and became effective at warning friendlies of upcoming enemy attacks within a 300-mile radius. At the same time, Grumman kept developing an improved AEW aircraft that could fulfill the Navy's desire for integrating it into the Naval Tactical Data System aboard Navy ships. The Tactical Data System was a computerized information processing system developed by the Navy in the 1950s for use in combat ships. It took reports from different sensors on different ships and produced a single unified map of the battle space. This information could then be relayed to each ship and to the weapons operators, bolstering combat awareness and coordination. By then, Grumman was under extreme pressure as the E-1 Tracer was quickly becoming obsolete, given its insufficient radio and radar communications to help the Navy avoid enemy attacks. Still, the company finally delivered the E-2 Hawkeye, and the Navy Bureau of Aeronautics took it without a doubt. Design and Improvements Although the E-2 Hawkeye aircraft greatly resembled its predecessor, it was more powerful and capable as an AEW. Still, Grumman had to make several adjustments to the Hawkeye to accommodate it for carrier use. The first prototype took to the skies on October 21, 1960, and the first test with a fully equipped E-2 took place a year later, in April of 1961. Like the Tracer, the Hawkeye featured a large radome atop the fuselage, where its radar and electronic systems were located. And while the Tracer featured four-bladed propellers, the Hawkeye had eight. Grumman had also replaced the piston engine for two Allison Rolls-Royce turboprop engines that rendered over 5,100 horsepower each. The wings housed the engines and were mounted high on the fuselage, and to help the radar systems and overall control of the aircraft, the Hawkeye's tail featured a four-finned assembly. The aircraft's nose was short to maximize crew visibility, which consisted of two pilots, a radar operator, an air control officer, and a combat information center officer. Additionally, the E-2 was also equipped with a tail hook for recovery landing, and its nose gear could be attached to the catapults of aircraft carriers for launch. Also, it kept Grumman's stow wing folding wing system. Operational History The new aircraft entered service with the Navy in January of 1964, before U.S. troops were deployed to Vietnam. However, the Hawkeyes soon began encountering severe problems that affected their overall performance. Some of these problems were related to the inadequate cooling system packed inside the avionics compartment, which frequently overheated due to improper ventilation. The dire situation prompted the eventual cancellation of the contract just after some 50 of them had been produced. Still, Grumman solved the issue by replacing the rotary drum computer with a Litton L304 digital computer, and the updated aircraft became the E-2B variant. During the war in Vietnam, the E-1s and E-2s spotted enemy aircraft for Allied fighters that were conducting operations in a particular area to support ground forces. They also conducted reconnaissance missions to detect enemy fortifications and artillery positions. In 1981, after the Vietnam War was over, the Hawkeyes saw action during an intercept mission in the Gulf of Sidra in the Mediterranean, directing a squadron of F-14 Tomcats that took down two Libyan Sukhoi Su-22s. Then, in 1986, the E-2s again oriented a Tomcats formation during Operation El Dorado Canyon to neutralize Libyan targets. During the Gulf War of 1991, Hawkeyes became essential for coordinating air and land missions after providing units with valuable information about hostile maneuvers and they assisted U.S. Hornets in tracking and shooting down two Iraqi MiG-21s. In the past decades, more powerful variants of the E-2s, 
such as the E2C and E2D, were deployed in the east to fight in the war on terror. The aircraft flew sorties, tracked enemy forces, coordinated close air support strikes, rescue operations, and airspace management. They also functioned as data link and communication relays for ground, air, and sea forces. In addition, Hawkeye squadrons also assisted when Hurricane Katrina struck the United States in 2005. Today, countries such as France, Egypt, Mexico, Japan, Israel, and Singapore have incorporated Hawkeyes into their armed forces to better coordinate their military operations. And in November of 2019, Lockheed Martin was awarded a contract to provide electronic warfare systems for the E-2D Advanced Hawkeyes currently used by the Navy, a modern system that can detect, intercept, and geolocate RF signals to identify weapon systems, including the type, function, and mode of intercepted emitters while improving situational awareness. The Hawkeye's career is far from over, and it continues to pose a significant threat in air warfare around the world. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below what you think of the radar capabilities of the Hawkeye as the decades have passed.